the honor of being the presentation before lunch after everyone's been sitting down for an hour and a half, super energetic and ready to, ready to go. So I'll try and get through all 92 slides. <laughs> I'm not joking. No, I know. Um, so, you know, thank you as well to the foundation for having me up. This is a great honor and, you know, I, I hope everyone is getting as much from these talks as I am. I'm learning a great deal. And, and some of what I'm learning is just feeling the energy in the room and seeing everyone fighting this disease that sometimes I feel like I struggle against on an island uh, day in, day out. I joked to one of my colleagues the other day, I'm going to bring a volleyball to clinic and paint a face on it just to have someone to talk to. <laughs> All right, so I have, I have no disclosures except that this talk will not be comprehensive. There's just too much to cover about cardiac sarcoidosis, and so I'll do the best I can to hit the high points. Uh, my outline, we're going to talk about what is cardiac sarcoidosis, and I titled part of this talk, The Pieces of the Iceberg, because some pieces uh, of cardiac sarcoidosis we can see above the water, but a lot is kind of below the water and unseen often. We'll talk about diagnostic criteria uh, and what's published and why your doctors might just flat out ignore them. Um, Dr. Moss mentioned the sweat test. If you want to watch a heart failure doctor sweat, walk into their office and say, I think I might have cardiac sarcoidosis because the diagnostic criteria are sometimes tough to follow and diagnosis is kind of a sweat-inducing thing. We'll talk about prevalence and how it's changing and it may be that we're changing. We'll talk about treatments a little bit and some take-home lessons. So a slide you've probably already seen, and from Dr. Oobie, sarcoidosis is multi-system inflammatory granulomatous disease of unknown etiology, the exact same words. And I say the same thing to my patients, and they also look at me like I have two heads as well. The other thing you'll see a lot about sarcoidosis is that it's called the great imitator or the great mimic. Um, so I decided for this talk I was going to go to PubMed, which is our uh, kind of medical, our compendium of medical um, publications and just type in great imitator and see how many diseases come up. So diseases within the last 20 years that have been described as the great imitator. <coughs> Appendicitis, I found that one interesting. <laughs> Appendicitis. Amelanotic spitzoid melanoma, classic. and osteolytic cystic lesion of the naviculum, my favorite great imitator. All right, so these are 20 different diseases. I stopped at 20. There are more uh, that have been described as the great imitator, which means I have a couple of questions. One, why are all these diseases imitating each other? And the fact that doctors aren't really very creative when they publish their papers. We call it the great imitator. But sarcoidosis in the heart really does imitate other perceived more common diseases very well. And that's because there can be multiple manifestations. There are three primary manifestations, and I'm gonna leave a lot on the table here because there are other ways cardiac sarcoidosis can present um, other than these three. But the big three, heart failure, conduction abnormalities, so a heart that goes too slow, or ventricular arrhythmias, a heart that goes too fast and can be fatal. In, in the world of heart failure, which is the world I predominantly, predominantly live in every day, uh, we kind of say heart failure and know what it means, but it's, it's a little bit of an op opaque term uh, for lay people. And so uh, heart failure is just the inability of the heart to pump enough blood around the body to meet the metabolic demands, or the ability to do so only when you're congested, when you have too much fluid accumulated. <clears throat> There are over half a million new cases of heart failure each year in the United States. It's a big number. And three to five percent are probably caused by sarcoidosis. So a relatively small percent, but a small percent of a big number is still a really big number. The other way, another way is rhythm disturbances, a heart that goes too slowly. So we're gonna get a crash course in electrophysiology here. Um, so we're gonna go through what normal conduction in the heart is. So normally, the uh, part of the heart called the SA node, it's like the spark plug of the heart. It's what sets your heart rate. It fires. The electrical impulse is carried through the atrium to the AV node, which then fires, and then conducts that electrical signal to the ventricles, the main pumping chambers of the heart. Um, and that causes those ventricles to squeeze. In cardiac sarcoidosis, often the SA node fires normally. You get normal conduction to the AV node, and sarcoid loves to affect this part of the heart in particular the AV node, and it's sarcoid, that granulomatous inflammation or over time scarring will stop that conduction right there, and you'll get what's called heart block. And then conduction cannot be 
continue forward to the ventricles, and you get a very slow heart rate. On an EKG, we're going deep here, you're going to get EKG now, aren't you? <laughs> this is a normal EKG uh, for one of my patients. Every spike is a heartbeat. A heart block EKG will often look like this. Not enough heartbeats in that rhythm strip. And this person's going to feel very tired. They may pass out. They'll feel fatigue. And oftentimes, if therapy doesn't reverse this quickly, our patients will need a pacemaker. If you take patients that have AV block, that condition I just described, and say, I'm going to rule out other known causes, meaning I know they didn't have a heart attack, I know they don't have something like Lyme disease or another cause, up to a third of those patients will have AV block due to cardiac sarcoidosis. We see a lot of AV block patients that are unknown, and I guarantee you in routine practice, cardiac sarcoidosis is not being looked at enough for this. So we talked about heart failure, we talked about bradycardia or conduction abnormalities. Now we'll talk about uh, the opposite, which is a heart that can go too fast. So this is that same cutaway picture of the heart that you've seen before. The, the two chambers on the bottom are the ventricles, the so squeezing chambers of the heart. And if I kind of blow that up, we kind of get down a little closer to it. If you have areas in the heart that are, say, inflamed or scarred by granulomatous disease, in this case, those kind of gray, cloudy looking things, what can happen is the electrical signal that goes to the ventricle normally can start going around, being circulated around and around those areas of scar inflammation. And that happens very, very quickly. And that can set up an EKG that looks like this. And this is ventricular tachycardia. So if you watch medical shows and you know the, you, know, you see the shows where the doctors get the paddles and say clear and they shock, this is the rhythm they're shocking. And this is going to be a fatal rhythm. It can cause sudden cardiac death, it can cause syncope or patients to pass out. Sometimes patients come in and say, I just feel bad. I saw a person two weeks ago who, on a plane from Florida, flew up and had been in a rhythm like this for about four days. <laughs> and it was amazing, just kind of walked in feeling a little tired. Um, but this is the thing that we really fear in cardiac sarcoidosis, because it's unpredictable um, and, and can be deadly. Again, if you take all patients that come in with ventricular tachycardia and you rule out ischemic disease, meaning they haven't had heart attacks, they don't have blockages in the coronary arteries, up to a third of them will have VT due to cardiac sarcoidosis. I think also vastly uh, underappreciated in clinical practice. Other manifestations, pericarditis or inflammation of the lining outside the heart, coronary blockages, those granulomas that can affect everywhere can get into arteries as well and come aneurysms. They can get in the valves. Other than ventricular arrhythmias, they can cause atrial arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation or flutter, and isolated right ventricular failure. So the left ventricle that pumps blood to the body, that right ventricle that's affected by the pulmonary hypertension that Dr. Madapati talked about, it can be in, uh, affected by granulomas and inflammation as well. So even within the world, the fairly insular world of cardiology, I've just mentioned eight different ways that cardiac sarcoid can, can present. So it really is a very effective imitator. I mentioned the iceberg, and so if you think about the kind of prevalence of cardiac sarcoid, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around because it's hard to see the whole disease, just like an iceberg. Depending on geography, most cardiac sarcoid goes unrecognized. If you look at autopsy data or advanced imaging studies, if you take everyone with cardiac sarcoid and give them an MRI and a PET scan of their heart, it suggests that up to 25% of patients with sarcoid have cardiac involvement. Only 5% of that is what the studies call clinically manifest. What I think probably means is it's recognized. There are probably clinical manifestations that go unrecognized or attributed to other organ system involvement. And so visually, it looks like this, where 5% of patients with sarcoid are told you have cardiac involvement, and really 25% of them do, and that percent are, are termed clinically silent or under-recognized. <coughs> and the reason is because the diagnostic criteria are, are tough, right? They're hard to deal with. And I'll go through kind of the uh, historical perspective of diagnostic criteria of cardiac sarcoid, mainly to give you a sense of how we as cardiologists wrestle with this. Um, to give diagnostic criteria uh, writers their due, it's hard to write these things because they have to serve multiple masters. They have to serve us, the clinicians, you, the patients, but also research studies, and they don't want to make their criteria too broad, or research studies will include patients that don't have cardiac sarcoid, make it too narrow, and it's hard for clinicians to actually diagnose someone with it. 
So the Access Research Group, which you've heard mentioned in talks here before, was in 1999. Um, the criteria required a positive endomyocardial biopsy. So you had to have a biopsy of the heart, which is a test we can do relatively safely, um, that said you have granulomas in your heart. Um, if you look at uh, these criteria, we're only going to focus on the, on the sarcoid here. These are patients that had a biopsy, um, confirmed sarcoid, and you either got definite, probable, or possible cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, so you had to have a positive biopsy, and you can read there what gave you definite sarcoidosis was treatment response to cardiomyopathy, which is heart failure, an EKG showing either conduction defect, or you had a positive imaging study called a gallium scan. We don't use those much anymore. The Japanese ministry criteria came out many years later. These are often quoted in papers, but again, you either had a histologic diagnosis group, which was an endomyocardial biopsy, or a clinical diagnosis group, which lets you diagnose cardiac sarcoid clinically, but you had to have extra cardiac sarcoid also diagnosed histologically, which means by a biopsy. So either a biopsy of the heart or a biopsy of another organ system, um, and then you met other criteria. Uh, that you can see their major or minor criteria focusing on either symptoms, presentation, or imaging criteria. The Heart Rhythm Society in 2014 is the most updated criteria for cardiac sarcoidosis and again mimics the Japanese ministry criteria a lot. You either get, histo you get it by getting a, a biopsy, histologic examination of myocardial tissue, or you have to have a biopsy showing extra cardiac sarcoid and they just updated the major and minor criteria mostly to include advanced imaging techniques like cardiac MRI or PET scan. So, if you take all these diagnostic criteria, and cardiologists love their diagnostic criteria and their randomized clinical trials and things like that, and you lump them all together, they all require either biopsy-proven cardiac sarcoidosis or extra cardiac sarcoidosis. But, endomyocardial biopsy for sarcoid has a sensitivity of less than 25% in most studies, which means if, if I know you have sarcoid in your heart and I take you for a biopsy, I'm going to miss it three out of four times. And up to one-third of patients with mani clinically manifest cardiac sarcoid have isolated cardiac sarcoid disease, meaning they don't have disease in other organ systems. So both of these criteria have big holes in them for diagnosing cardiac sarcoidosis. And that's why this becomes a sweat test for us, because I can't go back to a criteria and cookbook this. I can't do check, 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 yes, this is cardiac sarcoidosis, or no, it's not, because I know these holes are there. So these often leave me feeling a little lost, and some of my colleagues feeling lost. But in other ways, it's a little bit freeing. One of my mentors who taught me to uh, treat and uh, evaluate patients for cardiac sarcoidosis said, this patient doesn't need a guideline, they need a doctor. Um, and I like to quote that to myself in clinic, I'm a doctor. Um, so, <laughs> you're in the right place. The other thing he used to say is the classic, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and looks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, and that's hard to write into clinical guidelines. You probably get left out of the kind of statement. Um, but this is kind of a guiding principle for me when I'm trying to evaluate a patient for cardiac sarcoma. The other thing we know is that the prevalence looks like it is rising. So um, if you look in Finland, we talked about the Scandinavian cohort of patients being very common. The diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid has increased 20 times uh, since uh, 1988 to 2012. And in the U.S., if you just look at our transplant population, uh, the uh, cardiac sarcoid listed as the reason for heart transplant has gone up five-fold in 20 years. Treatment, similar to what you've seen before, immunosuppression. Corticosteroids are kind of the bedrock of initial therapy for cardiac sarcoidosis, and we can get pretty aggressive with therapy because that ventricular arrhythmia risk really has us worry day in, day out sometimes. The problem, we don't have what cardiologists love, randomized clinical trials to show that corticosteroids unequivocally absolutely improve survival. Studies that have been done so far are non-randomized, are fair quality, are often retrospective. We don't know how much to give, and we don't know how long to give it. There's expert consensus that helps guide us, um, but we need those clinical trials. Most experts agree, start with somewhere to 30 to 40, sometimes higher, milligrams to day, uh, per day of prednisone and taper over one to three months. Tapering schedules may vary depending on how severe the disease is. 
Um, and you reassess response by imaging. And again, that's often by cardiac MRI or PET. We know that steroids are bad for people long term, and so we are often focused on getting patients on steroids sparing immunosuppression. Cardiac sarcoid doesn't always behave like pulmonary sarcoid. It doesn't just relapse on its own. Um, and so our patients are often on long-term immunosuppression. I've listed some options here. Methotrexate probably has the most weight of evidence behind it for cardiac sarcoid. Other people use mycophenolate, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, and fliximab. If a patient has heart failure, we know that there are other non-immunosuppression heart failure medications which can help. I've listed those here, and these are the medicines that I live day in, day out, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone inhibitors. And a patient with poor squeezing function of the heart should be on these medications if they're able to tolerate them. We get in a pickle when we think about that risk of sudden cardiac death, that ventricular tachycardia. We have a way to prevent that, it's with defibrillators, but those carry risks as well. It's a procedure, risk of infection, risk of inappropriate shocks. And so trying to find the right patient with sarcoid who needs a defibrillator, who will benefit and not risk, is difficult because they don't fit in our, our typical heart failure guidelines. Um, if a patient has a known ventricular arrhythmia, they need a defibrillator. If their ejection fraction, so the, uh, they measure the squeezing function of the left ventricle and remains low, despite therapy for both sarcoid and their heart failure, they need a defibrillator. And, things, and then things start getting into what's called class two recommendations, which is you can consider and maybe it's a good idea. Uh, so if you're placing a permanent pacemaker, that should probably include a defibrillator. If a patient's passed out before and you think, gosh, that sounds worrisome, they should have a defibrillator. If they have an electrophysiology study and you can, make, you can induce a ventricular tachycardia arrhythmia, then a defibrillator is reasonable. Um, if their ejection fraction is a little low, but not below 35%, or if their right ventricular ejection fraction is low, it's reasonable. Or if we look on an imaging study, and, and cardiac MRI gets called out, but we also use PET scan and perfusion scans to help guide us here. If they have a lot of scar or inflammation on those imaging studies, a defibrillator is also reasonable. Pacemakers are a little more straightforward. If a patient has AV block um, that we talked about before, complete heart block, bradycardia, um, they need a pacemaker. So, take home messages. Cardiac sarcoid is responsible for a higher percent of heart failure, conduction disease, and ventricular arrhythmias than we give it credit for, and when I say we, I mean cardiologists. It's more prevalent in patients with extra cardiac sarcoid than we give it credit for. The diagnostic criteria for cardiac sarcoid likely remain too specific and not sensitive enough for strict adherence to them in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Uh, treatment is largely based on expert opinion. There's a lot of nuance to dose, duration, activity, and when to reassess. So, as diagnosis and treatment of cardiac sarcoid requires a multidisciplinary team of physicians, and as my mentor also said, you've got to have seen a few ducks to know what one is. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the, the team of uh, people that helped me take care of cardiac sarcoid at my institution, the pulmonologist, Dr. James, who you've seen his name mentioned on a couple of slides here on the top left. Dr. Riss Miller, uh, Dr. Reeder Siriani, uh, Dr. Winterfield, and Dr. Tedford uh, are all my support system that help us think in kind of multidisciplinary ways through this complex disease. Thank you very much.